You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC88, the most popular Japanese PC series of the 1980s. Today we're looking at Zelliard, a 1987 action RPG from Game Arts, the same Game Arts that made Sylphid, Lunar, Grandia, and Vig's Tactical Gladiator. Old school PC gamers may remember Zelliard since it was one of four Game Arts titles that was licensed to Sierra Online and ported over for the West on MS-DOS. But what's the original PC-88 version of the game like? We're gonna find out. According to this sticker, the game was distributed by SoftBank, the same SoftBank that's now one of the three major cell phone service carriers in Japan. The back of the game has some screenshots and a description of the game's story. One thing I really like is that it says that if you have an 8MHz PC-88 to make sure that you run the game in 8MHz mode. That's refreshing since I feel like I've been covering a lot of games that need to be run in 4MHz lately. Inside, the Game Arts sticker that originally sealed the game has been stuck here. And though I don't have the manual, for some reason I do have this survey card that came with the game. And you're going to love this, it's the coolest! These full-color illustrations have been directly printed on the outer casing of the discs. It's not often that a company goes through this much effort to make their floppy disks look great. But one other example I can think of is a game called Gal Wars. For whatever reason, Zelliard's Disc 3 didn't get the same treatment, and is just a standard black disc with a colored label. Lastly, my copy still has a fresh unused user disc sticker. So what happened to the manual? Fortunately, a PDF scan is easily available online. The first thing it says to do when starting the game is to insert disc 3 and a blank disc. We are taken to the Zelliard user disc creation tool. When we are ready, we can press return and then Y to confirm the creation process. And hey, that's cute. When the process is complete, we're instructed to remove both discs and replace them with the two beautiful printed discs 1 and 2 before pressing reset. The game uses the same FM voice synthesis process called CSM that they used in Sylphid. Here it sounds like the technology has been improved. You'll be hearing a lot of these voices throughout the game, but especially here in the opening, which begins with the revival of an evil Dark Lord after a 2000 year slumber. He tells us all about it in his own words. Oh great, now I'm gonna have nightmares. Next is the title sequence. Zelliard seems to have a vaguely Arabian theme in the title font and theme music, but it isn't really followed through throughout the game. Let's press a key here to watch the rest of the opening sequence. The kingdom of Felishka has been shrouded in clouds since the Dark Lord's return, and the princess of the kingdom is out watching the rain. Suddenly, it begins raining sand. The princess is turned to stone by the Dark Lord, and it continues to rain sand for 108 days. The king of Felishka is visited by the spirit who guards the holy land known as Zelliard, and is told that a chosen hero will appear to obtain nine jewels known as the Tears of Esmesanti to return the princess to human form. The next day, our protagonist, Duke Garland, arrives at the kingdom, surprised to find it covered in sand. He learns of the task at hand from the king, and the Dark Lord even appears to taunt him. Of course, the Dark Lord could easily destroy him any time he pleases, but he's bored and wants to see Duke try and navigate the labyrinths where the crystals are hidden. Otherwise, I guess we wouldn't have a game. And so he's off. We're asked to replace disc 2 with the user disc and press return. To skip the opening sequence next time, we can just power up with the two discs we currently have inserted. So we begin in front of Felishka Castle. We can visit the king to obtain 1000 gold to start our quest, and also pay our respects to the stone princess in the shrine nearby. To the right is the first town of the game. 
There are a number of shops here that you'll become well acquainted with, but first let's go ahead and enter the cave and check out the game. There's a transition screen that frequently appears between areas, featuring Duke running with his shield out. If you guessed these screens are here to conceal some of the loading time, you'd be correct. To me they seem like a side view version of the cave screens in Xanadu, but I'm sure many will be reminded of a much later game, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, except you can't control the character on these screens in Zelliard. But speaking of that game, is Zelliard a Metroidvania? You be the judge. Zelliard is a side-scrolling action game with very fluid animation for 1987. It kinda sucks that you jump by pressing up, but the two available trigger buttons are spoken for by your sword attack and magic, which consists mostly of projectile attacks. I get some Zelda 2 vibes from the shield, magic, and downward thrust attack. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link was released in Japan earlier the same year, by the way. The fact that you can move while swinging your sword makes the control feel really nice, but the short length of your sword near the beginning makes it really hard to attack enemies without getting hit, especially these bats. I love the wide attack while jumping, but it definitely doesn't guarantee the bats won't hit you before you hit them. One thing I've gotta love though is the sound it makes when Duke swings his sword. Your wife? What, do you think I'm going to buy a $20,000 truck just because you make that noise? I'll take it! The game allows you to take hits in rapid succession, and it can be frustrating going instantly from a near full life bar to dead. In order to make progress, you're going to want to try and get back to town while you're still alive. Going back and forth between the current town and stage you're working on is what Zelliard is all about. The fortune teller provides a number of important functions. This is where you save your game, and by the way, there's only one save file per user disk. You can also have him read your experience for you. <laughs> I love that. It's pure nonsense. If you have enough experience for a level up, then this is where that will happen. But most of the time he'll just tell you you don't have enough, or that you're almost there. It would be really nice if there was a way to see how much experience you actually have in this game, but unfortunately this is all you get. Lastly, the fortune tellers also teach you new magic each time you get to a new town. To restore your life, you've got to go to the church. Here's my favorite voice in the game. Amen. The church is free, but in the later towns it's replaced by inns, which of course cost money. The magic shops are actually the item shops which sell healing herbs and other one-time use items with temporary effects. Weapon shops sell swords and shields. The shields take damage whenever you get hit, and you're going to want to return to the weapon shops to have them repaired for a small cost before this number reaches zero. If it does, the shield will break and you'll have to spend a lot more money buying a new one. Swords on the other hand don't take damage and never break. Lastly, you have the bank. This is where you get gold. Rather than dropping gold, enemies in the stages drop something called almas. Almas. Almas for the poor. Here you exchange each alma for four gold. The other thing you can do here is deposit gold in your account. Why would you want to do this? Well, whenever you die, you lose all your gold and almas. But the money in your account remains safely in the bank. Still, dying in this game sucks. You're taken back to the last fortune teller you visited. You do get to keep any items you picked up, but in addition to losing all gold and almas you're carrying, you seem to also lose some of your experience. I've tested and I've seen times when the fortune teller told me I was close to a level up, but after dying shortly after, he went back to saying I still had a long way to go. I don't know for sure since the game won't just tell you how much experience you have, but I would guess that the game takes away about half your experience toward the next level every time you die. Because of this, I usually just reset and load my game when that happens. Unless I picked up something important like a key or defeated a boss before I died and feel like it would be too much trouble to do it again. So let's get through this first stage. The stages are pretty hard to navigate in this game, and while you may be able to figure out this first one on your own, I guarantee you are going to need maps to get through most of the later stages. And luckily they are easily available online. In most stages, you're going to need to find at least one key, and this first stage is no exception. You'll need one to open the boss room door, and one thing that's really nice is the game gives you plenty of warning before a boss, by playing this sort of heartbeat sound as you approach the door. 
Encounter. The bosses in this game are generally pretty cool and have a solid pattern to learn, but a few near the ending turn mostly into a battle of stats. You can use items like healing herbs during the bosses, and this menu is really quite nice and modern, isn't it? You can hold up to 5 items, and you can also change your currently equipped magic and wearable equipment here. The menu is opened with the escape key, and I found myself diving to press it before I die to use a healing item. You can use the gamepad to control the menu, but it would actually be really nice if you could also close the menu with the gamepad as well, like you can in Xanadu. You'll probably hear me referencing Xanadu a lot now since it influenced practically every Japanese PC RPG in the late 80s. So we defeat the first boss and obtain one of the tiers of Esmesanti. The game makes a big deal out of obtaining each one of these, and for good reason. Later in the game, obtaining even one usually takes hours of gameplay, and is a huge accomplishment. After defeating the boss, the door to the next stage in town is opened. It's really cool that each of the 8 stages has its own BGM, and even the towns have 4 different BGMs throughout the game. The second town is underground, and hey all the money in my account is also available at the bank here. They've got a modern electronic banking system across multiple branches. The third stage is the first one made up of two different caves which you need to navigate between using doorways. The color of each doorway indicates which doorway it corresponds to in the other cave. But this isn't really much help. Trying to navigate this game's stages, even with the maps, broke my brain. And the fact that the stage layouts repeat not only left and right, but also up and down is even more confusing than it sounds. You're just not thinking fourth dimensionally. Right, right, I have a real problem with that. This third stage is also the first time I felt I really needed to do some grinding before I could explore. Grinding is tough since it's so easy to die in this game. An item called the Magia Stone will make things a lot easier. These are pretty expensive and will only last until the next time you enter a town. But you've gotta spend money to make money. It's worth it for how overpowered it is. In sharp contrast to a similar looking item in Sylphine that lasts for about 2 seconds. Most of the earlier bosses in the game are also a cinch with this item. Haha, <laughs> the boss of this stage is a freaking chicken. Next is the ice theme stage, and here you'll find the first piece of wearable equipment, a pair of shoes that prevent you from slipping. Later, there are also shoes which protect you from dangerous surfaces, and ones which allow you to jump up these slopes. You may have noticed that there's no real story in Zelliard aside from the opening and ending of the game, but in this town we can see one of the few small attempts at a plot. A shoemaker was asked to make shoes for the protagonist by the spirit of Zelliard, but was then killed by the Dark Lord so that he couldn't make shoes anymore. If it weren't for Duke, then he would still be alive, his former lover says. After you find the first pair of shoes though, she apologizes and asks that you avenge the shoemaker by destroying the Dark Lord. The ice stage has the first section where you'll have to do some serious platforming. I thought these early platforming sections in this game were difficult, but they just keep getting harder and harder throughout the game. Keep in mind that you have to press up to jump. The platforming sections are unforgiving and often force you to take a lot of damage or redo a large section of the stage if you should fall. The sixth stage is where things really start to get hard, and you'll probably be stuck here for a while, even if everything has been going smoothly so far. The platforming section at the end of this one has a leap of faith. Once you climb up to the ledge you need to fall from, you can no longer see the platform on which you need to land. You have to try to time it by watching it from down here and then climbing up and falling at the right time. It's not easy to do, but at least you don't get set back too far here if you miss. The seventh stage is the point where I nearly rage quit, or at least considered playing something else for a while to make a different video. This is a fire themed stage where you get constantly hurt unless you buy a special cape in town. The cape costs 5,000 almas. That's right, it costs almas, not gold. To give you some idea how much that is, the most I'd ever had at once by this point was about 1,000. Somehow you need to accumulate 5,000 of them without ever converting any into gold, since you can't just convert some of your almas to gold, it's all or nothing. Zelliard is a really grindy game. Leveling up is a slow process, and farming almas is even slower. 
The best method I could come up with involves causing these slimes to multiply by hitting them with the regular attack, then taking them all out with one blast of fire magic. This looks like a lot of almas, but it only gives you the cheap red ones that are worth 1, and sometimes the blue ones worth 10. Later on, I found what's probably the best farming area in the game, where the succubi respawn every time you go through the door, and leave a dark red one worth 50 almas, but even here, it's really slow going. Not only the expensive cape I mentioned already, but the best shield and the second best sword in the game cost a ridiculous amount of gold, which means more farming for almas. This is all made much worse by another thing I haven't mentioned, the exchange rate. In the first two towns, the banks give you a nice 4 gold for each alma, and the bank in the third town gives you 6. Nice, guess the rate is just going to keep getting higher, right? Wrong. 6 is as good as it gets, and starting with the fourth town, you're going to be getting ripped off by the exchange rate for the majority of the game. Most banks give you 2 gold per alma, and the bank in the fire town gives you the insulting rate of 1 gold per 4 almas. That's right. Almas are worth less than gold here, so to keep from getting ripped off, you've got to keep going all the way back to the third town every time you need to exchange almas for gold. If this were a modern metroidvania type game, you would expect there to maybe be a warp item, or at least shortcuts between the previous towns. And in Zelliard, indeed there are actually shortcuts back to most of the previous towns, which is nice, but they only work when going backward. When going forward, at least you don't have to fight the bosses again, but you do have to go all the way through the most difficult platforming sections of each stage again. The amount of time it takes to do this is not insignificant at all. Before you get really good at these platforming sections via repetition, which of course I eventually did, one trip between the seventh stage and the third can take an hour or more. And if you don't do this, it's just going to take even longer to obtain enough gold using the crappy exchange rates in the later towns. Now, maybe you're someone who's played the MS-DOS version of Zilliard, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't remember it being that bad, and you'd be right. I was looking at the English language walkthrough for the game and noticed that the cape I had to buy for 5,000 almas costs only half that much in the MS-DOS version. It also mentions that since you just had to fight one boss and a mini-boss just before this part, you should already have enough almas from defeating them. W what In the MS-DOS version? The bosses give you almas? So this was a big revelation for me right here. The English MS-DOS version, released three years later, was dramatically rebalanced to make it a far less grindy game. Even the exchange rates were made much less brutal. I know most people complain when game localizers mess with the difficulty, but in my opinion, this is one case where it was well warranted. Game Arts took their own game they worked hard to make and practically ruined the original version by requiring a simply unreasonable level of grinding in order to complete it. Hell, Sierra Online saved this game, so you may not have expected that opinion from a PC-88 fan, but there it is. And nonetheless, I'm still gonna spend the time to power through and finish the original PC-88 version for this video, cause that's what I do. So let's get back to that fire stage, the second last stage of the game. The dragon boss here is widely considered to be the most difficult. Even knowing the pattern, it's pretty hard to win without a really powerful attack. You're going to need to use an item called the Saber Ring, known as Saber Oil in the English version, which increases your attack power, and you can stack more than one of them. Still, I found even with three, I was going to need to save up for a new sword here in order to have a chance. So more Alma farming. Even once you have the sword, it isn't a sure thing, and this stage is by far the most difficult platforming so far. In order to retry the boss, I had to perform a small platforming miracle every time. Almost any small mistake here means you're going to need to hit reset and start over from town. It took quite a few tries to conquer this boss. Then we're on to the final town and stage. This one requires you to make another leap of faith in order to fall down this hole and grab a key. This is the only key in the game, I think, which is for a specific door located back in stage 6. Here there's a secret room containing the best sword, as well as high jump shoes. Hell yeah, now we're in business. There's even a shortcut back to the final stage, as well as a shortcut from there to stage 6 that I actually just used a second ago to get to that locked door. Why the game decides to finally throw the player a bone here near the end is beyond me, but the last stage even has an awesome hidden town called Esco. 
You can't save in this town, but it does have a church where you can heal for free. Amen. And everything is pretty cheap here. Best of all, this is the only town that has the same awesome exchange rate as the third one. Finally, no more trips back. This is all a nice bit of relief for the player, but the final stage is still gonna kick your ass. Enemies can kill you pretty easily, the maze is impossible to navigate without a map, and of course the most difficult platforming of the game is here. Without a map or walkthrough, you'll reach a dead end and never figure out that instead of going up here, you need to go down here and jump in a specific spot in order to hit an invisible gust of wind that will counterintuitively carry you up to where you need to be. But even knowing that, everything in this section needs to be done perfectly. By this time, I was good enough at controlling Zellyard that I knew the platforming in this game is hard, but fair. Even though you press up to jump, the control is precise and when you screw up, it's your own fault. I knew that by this point, but the obscenities that were yelled at my screen during earlier platforming sections of the game are best left unrepeated. The boss of this stage actually has a mostly safe spot that can be exploited to win. I still screwed up and had to redo all that platforming several times though. Beat this boss and only the final tier of Esmesanti in the middle remains. We're taken immediately to a room before the final boss. Here I thought it would be a good idea to use an item to return to town and save my game. I even managed to get another level up at the fortune teller thanks to doing this. But it turns out you still have to fight the boss again. I guess that's why one of the townspeople told me he was immortal. Both the two final bosses have to be done in one go. So anyway, let's do the final boss. He congratulates Duke for making it this far and giving him a good show, but says he won't take it easy on him. This took me at least a couple of tries, but it definitely isn't the most difficult boss of the game. It's possible to avoid his projectiles most of the time, but toward the end of his life meter, he has sort of a second phase where he starts running away and becomes difficult to reach with your attacks. He'll start healing himself, and if you let him get all his life back, he'll revert back to his first phase and you'll start all over again. On my next try, I definitely didn't want that to happen again, and was aggressive as possible during the second phase, even using my magic to take away a tiny bit more when I couldn't reach. At last the end boss is down, and I have the final tier added to the HUD. And you know what, let's actually go ahead and put a spoiler warning here, cause there are a couple of surprises in the ending. We are shown our hero, Duke Garland, falling over and passing out, and he awakens in front of the castle from the beginning of the game. The old man explains that the spirit of Zelliard carried him there. Everyone in the king tells you to hurry and bring the tears to the princess, and there we need to replace the user disc with disc 2. Disc 2 is only used for the opening and ending of the game. The princess is restored to normal, and the spirit comes to tell Duke that he has a new quest for him in a new land. Dude, hasn't he already been through enough? The princess tells him not to go. Duke, can I get but Duke listens to the spirit and sets off on his way. The people who wrote the Japanese and English walkthroughs I was using both seem pretty dissatisfied with this, even calling it an unhappy ending. But there is no other ending, and I don't know, he's just making a total Adol move by saying, sorry princess, but I'll be on my way. They did only just meet each other, after all. What are they supposed to do, like get married now or something? In retrospect, it probably wasn't a good idea though to make an ending which basically promises a sequel, seeing as how they never got around to making one. I can definitely see how this ending is unsatisfying and can only conclude that the developers must have hated the player, considering the game itself that led up to it. So who's responsible for this? The main programmer was Tadashi Shimayama, who seems to be mostly a sound programmer based on his credits from Vig's Tactical Gladiator and Firehawk. Graphics were by Akihiko Yoshida and Masatoshi Azumi, the second of whom worked on the graphics for a lot of game arts games, including Alicia Dragoon, Lunar, Grandia, and Gun Griffin. Illustrator Masahiko Ikea, aka Charlie Ikea, also did illustrations and artwork for many of the same games. Music was by game arts regulars Fumihito Kasatani and Nobuyuki Aoshima. And to be clear, these two only worked on game arts games up to about Alicia Dragoon, so you won't find them in the credits of best loved game arts soundtracks like Lunar or Grandia. But in my opinion, the music in Zelliard is quite good. I found myself humming the tunes after turning off the game, and the sheer number of them is commendable. They could have easily made fewer and reused them more if they'd wanted to. 
Zilliard is also actually one of the first games to use the soundboard too. However, it only takes advantage of it for three tracks. The rest use only the six monaural sound channels of the original PC-88 soundboard. The game does sound a lot like Sylphie, using many similar older sounding FM sounds, though it is still definitely a step up. There's also a minigame written in BASIC hidden on disc 2. You play a D for Duke and avoid the names of enemies as they scroll toward the top of the screen. There are also dollar signs for gold and at signs for almas. At the end of each stage you arrive at one of the towns from the game, each with a different almas exchange rate, and you're awarded life bonuses for your gold by the spirit of Zelliard. In addition to this minigame you can also view some messages from the developers and fans by simply booting the same disc. Zelliard was only ported to one other system in Japan, the Sharp X1 Turbo, which is kind of weird considering Silphied wasn't ported to this system, opting instead for a port to the Fujitsu FM77AV. Anyway, the X1 Turbo version of Zelliard looks virtually identical to the PC-88 version, but feels just a little bit held back by the system's 4MHz CPU compared to an 8MHz model PC-88. The game sounds only slightly different due to the X1 having a different stereo Yamaha sound chip from the PC-88 soundboard 2, and only the same three tracks as in the PC-88 version have stereo sound. The difficulty in this one has not been altered from the PC-88 original, as far as I can tell. And, as I'm sure you know by now, the other port of Zelliard was only in the West, for IBM-compatible MS-DOS computers. This one didn't come out until 1990, nearly a full three years after the original PC-88 version. I can't help but think this game must have felt pretty old by 1990, but the game was highly praised in reviews. Apparently there were few games like Zelliard available for PCs in the West at the time. As mentioned earlier, this version was made to be much less grindy via rebalancing, and you can even stand in place to regain your life, like in ease. But the difficult platforming and mazes of course remain. Quality of life features like a hard drive install, speed setting, and data load feature were added, and the game's default speed is quite a bit faster than the PC-88 version. All the voices are unfortunately missing, but the game does have MIDI support for the music, in addition to ad-lib. It also made PC Gamer's list of worst box art of all time. Those are some weird looking monsters, but they do look like actual enemies from the first stage, so I imagine the artist was at least shown footage of the game. His reimagined design of Duke Garland, though, is due to a complete misunderstanding. Those white things on his helmet aren't supposed to be horns, they're wings. Come on, Duke isn't supposed to be some kind of viking or dwarf, or viking dwarf. Zelliard is definitely a good action RPG for its time. The graphics, animation, and music were all top-notch by 1987 PC-88 standards, and even stood up to the scrutiny of Western critics in 1990. I had played earlier parts of this game when I first obtained it many years ago, and was certain that Zelliard was going to earn a solid recommendation from me. If you're someone who doesn't mind just playing the earlier parts of a game and putting it down once you get bored, then you'll probably have a great time with Zelliard. However, if you're a completionist who wants to see a game to its end, a world of frustration awaits you in the second half of the game, with difficult platforming, confusing mazes, long travel between locations, and a simply ungodly amount of grinding. I'd call it almost Xanadu hard, but it has a very different type of difficulty from Xanadu. At least in Zelliard, there are no mistakes that can't be undone. One might call the game a Metroidvania, but that might give people the wrong idea. The amount of towns to visit, as well as several other factors, gives the game not quite the same feel as games like Metroid or the non-linear Castlevanias. The scheme is a much more Metroid-like game in my opinion. So I'll leave it up to you whether to call Zelliard a Metroidvania or not. It's definitely a side-scrolling action RPG that has ability gating though. As a PC-88 fan, it pains me to say that if you choose to try Zelliard, you might want to stick to the MS-DOS version due to the difficulty. 
It's the only version in English, so I'm guessing that's what most of you would have done anyway. But if indeed the MS-DOS version is a true classic, at the very least we can say that it owes a great deal of its greatness to the good, albeit flawed, PC-88 original. Thanks for watching this episode of PC-88 Paradise. I want to give a special thanks to the folks on your screen for helping to make this video possible, and I hope to see all of you back soon for the next video. Thanks for watching.